today we'll get started. I do want to uh, call out some support here. Uh, th thank you uh, for sponsoring the program, both U of M Extension, as well as both of the uh, Minnesota Soybean and Corn Research and Promotion Councils uh, for, for their support for today. So, so thanks to them. Uh, again, um, today's topic, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, uh, soil fertility, nutrient management, and return on investment. Uh, you know, that's the topic of the day. And I think it's a, a prudent topic given the current situation. You know, it's early spring and we're already hearing rumblings of uh, price volatility as far as fertilizer is concerned and potential supply issues. You couple some of those with the current uh, status of the egg economy, uh, crop insurance uh, situation that we're facing, as well as the, the cost of credit and certainly uh, thinking about nutrient management decisions and, and getting that best return. Uh, on our investments in the, in that area is, is 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 something important to talk about right now. So with that, I'm Ryan Miller. I'm going to be moderating the session today. We've got two speakers uh, with us today. We've got Dan Kaiser, soil scientist, University of Minnesota Extension, uh, as well as Jeff Betch, uh, who's a soil scientist and researcher at the Southern Research and Promote or sorry, sorry Southern Research and Outreach Center. Uh, and we're going to use a little different approach today. Uh, you know, typically we've started these sessions with a uh, formal presentation for 20, 25 minutes, and then some discussion. Uh, we're going to start with Dan making some opening remarks, and then we're going to jump right into the discussion. So we're not going to have that formal presentation today. Uh, we will have Dan start, though, by, by making some comments, uh, and then we'll get started. So with that. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And with the number of questions that came in, I just thought it would be better off spend answering questions and having you sit here and listen to me talk and present something that you've probably already seen before if you've been to some of our meetings. So, um, you know, we had a, a podcast that we were on, Jeff. I know you weren't part of that. Uh, we recorded here on Monday. And I think one of the questions or one of the things that we were talking a lot about are some of these early fertilizer decisions. So a lot of this is... Um, I think pretty optimal time to talk about this, particularly with the field conditions, the way they are. I know I've been hearing some reports or getting some questions on early fertilizer applications. So there's, you know, a few things that I guess from the nitrogen side, you kind of some cautions maybe to look at, particularly with early urea. But, um, you know, certainly with, you know, field conditions being very fit, P and K right now. Uh, if you didn't get any of the lime down in the fall, I think it'd be probably a good time to do it at this point. Um but um, without any rainfall, I mean, a lot of the fertilizer just sitting on the surface, there's some risks. And that's one of the things P and K, you know, we need at least some time for that material to dissolve, particularly phosphorus. It's a little bit slower process. That I'd have some concerns at this point in time. But I mean, I think certainly those are the things I'd think about right now if you're getting a jump on things is... Um, you know, certainly PK lime would be something to think about. I think early anhydrous, you know, might be something also to consider at this point. Although if you're in some of the areas of the state, particularly South Central, I don't know, Jeff, if you've had any comments, but I'd maybe be considering maybe NSERV at this early stage. But it isn't always the case as we start getting closer to planning that um, a lot of these inhibitors really, we would have to worry about them. But, you know, the one that kind of scares me a little bit right now is um, urea. And it's not as much from the loss standpoint for nitrification and just nitrate loss. Um, at this point, there's some data floating out there that um, would show some significant volatility potential for the ammonia coming off of it, particularly if you're just letting it sit on the surface. And the rain we've been having, or any of the moisture we've been having, I think it's enough to get some of the processes going by which we start seeing some hydrolysis of the urea, but not necessarily enough to incorporate it. So just some things to think about right now because the way prices are, I mean, it is nice when you look at kind of the some of the fertilizer trends, what I've seen at least in the DTN on the markets that they were, were cheaper than it was about a year ago. But um, a lot of questions now with the prices the way they are. And I don't know, Jeff, if you've got any you know comments on prices right now, just you seem to be a little bit more up on that being out of the metro as kind of where I'm pinned in at. Yeah, I think that we've seen price declines are slowly declining through the through the late fall and winter. But, you know, for most of this fertilizer that's going on or has been on this crop, it's probably already pre-priced already. So they they may be locked in anyway. Um, but there isn't some opportunities for maybe if you're thinking of changing sources or doing something different or, or uh, maybe the economics are better now than you thought they were uh, three months ago, maybe you decide to do something else. But I think with the commodity prices being lower, I, I doubt that's the case for most growers. 
All right. Anything else you guys want to mention, or we can kind of start in here uh, with our first topic. All right. Well, well, let's get started. So the first kind of topic we're going to be hitting here is nitrogen. And so uh, there were several questions that came in uh, in regards to variable rate technology and uh, um, how you would uh, uh, use that and uh, any recommendations you might want to give around that. Um, you know, since our, our nitrogen rate recommendations or guidelines are based on the EONR, you know, how do we go about with uh, when we look at these variable rate technologies? And that's certainly a challenge because we know the MRTN just, you know, you're recommending a set rate, although there is a range there, but there's no guidance on how to use any of that range in data. And that's one of the things I've been thinking about a lot because while the technology is there, the the variable rate issue is a big question, um, you know, because when I start looking at a lot of our issues that we have, it'd sure be nice to have some way to look at making or helping make decisions before the fertilizer is applied. And that's one of the things that um, the MRTN, it's more of a target, at least to get you in a range. And then that's one of the things that we talk a lot about on some of the nitrogen smart programming. And then it's kind of knowing what you are understanding and, and looking at what you know about the nitrogen cycle to make decisions on where you might want to make some changes. I mean, I have been looking at the data and, and we, the thing that we do know that it, a lot of our variability isn't tied necessarily to maximum yield potential. Um, it's interesting. And I've been thinking about this the last six months or so looking at some of this data, there's a, a philosophy or some um, information out there, what's called the Delta yield approach or whatever. So it's looking at essentially the difference in yield between your minimum and your maximum in your fields. And it's one of the things, I mean, I do see, some evidence that if you look at at least the MRTN database, that difference, um, you know, obviously the less you produce without nitrogen, you know, it's going to likely lead to a situation where you're going to need more nitrogen fertilizer. So, you know, there's some things there I've been looking at to see, can we adapt this to look at this a little bit uh, more readily to give growers more of an opportunity? I mean, the other options we have for variable rate would be you know, um, technologies like uh, drone and aerial imagery. But the, you know, the issue I have with a lot of that is with the amount of residual nitrate we can carry, we just don't tend to see enough difference um, in some of our fields. I mean, that's my background here is one of the field locations we had. This was down by St. Charles a number of years ago where we've got some really nice variability out there with uh, the different nitrogen rates in that particular trial where you can see it very visually. But this has taken near tasseling. And, you know, at this point, I mean, it's really too late to make a lot of these decisions. So I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, what do we have right now for technology that would allow us to give or allow us to make some decisions up front? And we're pretty limited. I mean, the only thing I can think of, and I know, Jeff, if you can think of anything else, would be the, the pre-plant nitrate test. But, you know, looking at, we've got, I think, some more people taking those samples, but the, the overall guidance and whether or not we would think we'd have enough use for that or there'd be enough um, reasoning to take those samples really boils down to situations where we'd expect to have carryover residual nitrates, and that isn't going to be in every field. So then it's kind of a question then is, you know, can we adapt some of these things that we know? Because that's the, that's the thing about with these challenges with, nitri with, with nitrate loss. If it was simple, we'd have this figured out a long time ago, and it's just not simple unfortunately. And that's the thing that we're struggling with is, um, you know, it'd be nice to be closer to that target MRTN for a particular field on a given basis, but I just don't know how we get there. And it's interesting talking to a lot of other um, researchers when we start talking about what target or, you know, within what range would we consider ourselves to be managing things well? I mean, I'd like to, you know, be, say, you know, be within 10 to 15 pounds if we could get there on the MRTN on an annual basis, that'd be great. I mean, most researchers, I think, would say probably if we're plus or minus 40 pounds, we're doing good. And that's just because of the issues with the variability that's out there. So it, it's a tough one. Um, but, you know, said so I've lo been looking at some things because I, I can, if you look at this Delta yield approach, I can separate our MRTN database out. It's just a question of how well you can predict that in your field to know exactly what that that um, zero, what you would produce without no nitrogen to give you an idea on, on where your starting point is and whether or not that number is stable over time. I don't know. There's there's a lot of questions right now. So there's some things we're looking at, but I just I just wish we'd have a better, better idea on how to use the data we have right now because we've got quite a bit of data that was collected in the field. It just, you know, can we adapt that to 
fit better with a variable rate nitrogen approach. Yeah, yeah I would add, Dan, oh, I would add go ahead, that, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I've seen a few of my N-rate trials, too, where the delta yield in corn after beans seems to be a pretty good indicator of sites that need a higher rate of nitrogen or, and probably a little higher than our MRTN would predict. Um, I think one of the challenges with the delta yield is, is there's a couple things that are key. One is you need to have a field that has very little nitrogen out there or zero N. And that's hard to come by in a farmer's field, especially with the you know MAP and DAP applications, AMS applications. Um, all of a sudden you get that delta yield is kind of inflated because there's a fair amount of N that's already in the field that you can't really get rid of. And you can leave a small area maybe that's untreated that might be might be successful. But um, as far as the in-season sensing, Dan, I, I kind of agree um especially in corn after beans there's just too much n in the system you don't get a indication of the n producing ability of that field until the crop gets quite a ways along and it gets pretty risky to to delay that much to delay delay almost all n application to that point where i see the in-season sensing either remote sensing or with the drone or however you want to do it where i see it having some practicality is is just in rescue treatments. You know, every year, now the last two years, maybe not so much, but most years we get these areas of the state that just get way too much rainfall in, in June and July, and they've got areas of the fields that are that are clearly deficient, and maybe that drone technology can help identify them relatively easy, or even just aerial imagery, and determine whether or not those areas of fields can be treated separately, or maybe just that whole field needs in a, a supplemental end application. And and that gives a little ground truthing um, to those types of decisions. I think from just a, a, you know, thinking of variable rate N, I think what people often think about is that, okay, I'm going to go out there and find, I'm looking at my yield maps in the winter, and I'm going to find all the best yielding areas of the field, and I'm going to find the poor yielding ones. And then I'm going to base my variable N rate maps on those, on those decisions. Where's the best yielding parts and where are the poor yielding parts? The problem with that is that it assumes that yield level is is correlated or affected by the return or economic optimum end rate or how much N is needed. And our MRTN uh, approach for nitrogen has shown that that relationship is not very good. In fact, it's quite poor. And there often is no relationship between yield level and optimum end rate. So that has to be considered. And I think that's a it's a difficult thing for growers and for even at crop consultants to relate to because they think, well, if yields are greater, I'm going to need more nitrogen. But oftentimes it's more related to the, the environment that that field, whether it's a wet area of the field or dry area of the field, and then the nitrogen producing ability of that soil at that location. And that's one of the things with the MRTN you've got to remember is that we're really focused on that one in return per pound of N. So we don't really care as much as the maximum. We just want to make sure that essentially that we're getting a positive return for the investment of nitrogen itself. And I think that's the thing that kind of people struggle with a little bit because you can have a poor yielding area that is one of the issues overall. It might not be profitable, but we know that the nitrogen side of it, we're, we're actually returning what we're at least investing in the nitrogen. And that I think that's kind of the challenge. And the, one of the other things that we tend to see is there's always that debate on um, feeding the rich versus starving the poor. I mean, do you essentially just reduce inputs in areas that aren't overly profitable? And I mean, I'm just not necessarily sure that's the best option because this Delta yield stuff we're looking at would really say that some of those poor areas, the ones that are going to get a higher efficiency of the nitrogen and a higher ROI from the for, per pound of N applied that, we, we tend to see a greater return at those points in the areas that are good, essentially are good just from a reason. And a lot of that's because we get, you look at organic matter mineralization and just the overall supply of nitrogen from the soil itself, that, you know, a lot of things that impact the optimal levels or the optimum, what's really cranking out nitrogen from the soil, are those that also are optimal for, uh, for plant root growth. So you see better exploration of the soil and just better overall productivity. So it would start making some sense to me, essentially, that when we start looking at those those good areas, are they're good for a reason. Now, 
One of the other arguments, too, on suboptimal rates is whether or not we're actually hindering or hurting ourselves with some of that natural supply by not supplying enough nitrogen. And that's something I can't necessarily answer. That's a longer term question. And that's kind of that question of mining organic matter or it. So that's one of the things we do have a study out through funded through AFREC, which I don't know, Jeff, it's what, about year five or year six? the long-term nitrogen study where we're looking at um, blocks where we have no nitrogen versus um, above optimal rates just to kind of look at or get into the really the the crux of that that particular argument to see what's happening there. So there's there's a few things going on. And like I said, if you look at the nitrogen cycle, it's complicated. And if it's, you know, as simple, if it's like P and K where we didn't have to worry about loss and it would carry over and the soil test tends to work better in terms of a risk assessment. Um, it'd be a lot easier than it actually is. So uh, question for you guys, for someone looking to use a late spring or what I'll call the pre dress nitrate test, uh, are there pointers you'd give to that person, uh, cautions, those sorts of things, uh, if they're going to try to use that as a, a strategy for potentially variable rating or supplementing nitrogen uh, in that early summer period? So there's one thing that you have to recognize too, that a lot of like the pre dress nitrate test, it is measuring nitrate. So it's not measuring ammonium. So it's one of the things with it, you want to take it early enough where you can make a decision, but late enough where hopefully whatever fertilizer or anything you've applied has been fully converted to nitrate at that point in time. So I know Jeff, it's like late May to early June. I mean, generally the, the Iowa recommendations and we, we don't have any set ones ourselves, but they'd recommend um, taking it before the corn is about 12 inches tall. And the nice thing about that then is if you can get the data back relatively quickly, which most labs will do. That's one thing I will say our our labs are really good about turnaround in this state that um, then you can still go and make a decision because normally our side dress applications, if you're doing a planned side dress, you know, really by about V10, I would say probably max kind of depends these drier years. I'd want it on a little bit earlier, but um but then that's a question, are you doing that for a plan side dress or are you doing that for a rescue treatment? And that's one of the things that I've been kind of looking at. Um, we said we haven't had any good um, recommendations, really are hard recommendations for using the pre-side dress nitrate test. But I'm just looking more and more that the pre-plant plus the pre-side dress nitrate test might be a good thing to use in areas where we'd expect to have some residual nitrate carryovers where you could use one test to kind of determine how much you apply up front then follow up with a second test to tell you whether or not there's enough there. And that's really the the, the challenge with the pre dress nitrate test is we've got a good point generally at which we know we have enough. When we're below that, it becomes a little more questionable then in what do we do? So we know we're probably going to be short, um, but how much end do we need to apply? And right now, I mean, the, the data that Fabian has, uh, we look at that, that critical level for it's somewhere between 20 and 26 somewhere in there for part per million. And it is part per million, not pounds per acre for the one foot test. It, we'd use part per million for that. So it's that's been kind of the struggle is that a lot of these tests, it's kind of like the basal stock test at the end of the season, it kind of becomes more of a report card. But for the management side of it, in terms of beyond that, how much do I apply if I have set number, that's where it becomes a little more questionable. Okay. Dan, what, what I would add is a couple things. Uh, one of the things where the PSNT um, can be challenging is when you've got banded applications of nitrogen, either as anhydrous ammonia or some kind of manure, or maybe you've got a, a starter band of 20 pounds of N out there. You got to make sure that you, you don't get too many hot spots in those in those samples and, and end up just or kind of skewing your data. Another challenge can be related to that I've noticed the last two years is these really dry springs that we saw, especially last year. I had extraordinarily high PSMT values, and they were not anywhere near the the critical values were often uh, reached with the first or second end rate in end rate trials, and we still needed significantly more end than that. So that that's kind of a red flag. I would probably use that test in years when we have more normal spring rainfall. And I think what's going on there is if you've got spring end applications, in this case, it was a, a spring pre-plant incorporated urea, and then we did PSNTs in early June. And I think all that end was in the top two, three inches because it never really went anywhere because there was just no moisture to move it into the rest of the profile. So we got very high values because the nitrogen that was in the field was so concentrated near the surface. 
and that can skew then your results and you have to be cautious of that. Okay, hey, uh, we got a 2023 scenario question that came in here. Um, so this person had manure applied in spring of 2023. Uh, the crop failed due to drought and it was terminated mid-July. So they're looking at uh, trying to figure out, uh, you know, how much nitrate might be left there and uh, what kind of ideal uh, timing uh, you might have for a spring test uh, to kind of make that assessment and how to kind of go about that, I guess. I think that's a that's a classic example of where the pre-plant end test to two feet could be really, really effective at determining that. And they could theoretically take those now, but Dan, I think I would still wait until April just because you want to make sure that the weather that we have over the next few weeks doesn't move that end too far. But anytime in early April, uh, two, if you can get those two foot samples, that would be really good at determining how much end there. And we have guidelines at the extension website and how to, how to interpret that test and how to take that credit. Yeah, and I think I agree with you, Jeff. I mean, delaying would be better, but honestly, if it's a question of getting them versus not getting them, I mean, I would just do them at this point. I mean, obviously, there may be some change. And the main thing that I'd be looking for is if you're dealing with a situation, if you're anywhere over, say, 15 part per million in a two-foot sample, that's a fair amount. You know, normally, we don't use, we don't convert those to pounds per acre, but, you know, if you want to just think about it in the terms, you know, you could uh, multiply by eight. So if you're at 15, you'd be looking at um, about 120 pounds rough credit in there um, in terms of what could potentially be carried over. And that's really what I'd be looking for. And that's what I'd be interested in is just seeing if, do you have elevated levels? Because that would be a situation where, I've I've seen it. I've had this in a, and this is in the southeast too, an area we don't normally think of the the two foot end test being um, a thing. Um, a grower had cover crops. He had manure in the rotation. I mean, my fall tests were coming back around twenty four part per million, which our current credit for that would be over like to close to two hundred pounds with that plus. Um, with with that, um, we took them in the spring. They were or higher. They're twenty six. We took them pre plant, so we know they're going to change. But with those high levels, I don't think they're going to change enough where we could necessarily say that this isn't something we should be looking at crediting. So, you know, that'd be a situation maybe I just, if I haven't applied anything that you put maybe a small starter rate, maybe up to 30 pounds of nitrogen down with the planter, then come back and reassess it with the pre-side dress and just see where you're at. And if you're at that 25, 26, I would, I would suspect you should have enough to carry you through. So that's one of the, the things I think would be a good example of that. And if it meant getting it now, if you can get it versus, you know, waiting, waiting probably would be better. I just go out and do it, but take a two foot sample. And then if the lab gets it back, they might send it in pounds per acre, divide that by eight. And that's where I've set our recommendations. I've got a table on the website, which we could throw a link in here somewhere in terms of the corn website and where you can find that. So I think you guys have kind of answered this, but there's another question that came in kind of in the same vein of, you know, we've had two dry years and they don't indicate where they're we're, uh, typing from, I guess, but uh, uh, two dry years, potential for some residu residual end uh, and, you know, whether there's enough uh, to cut fertilizer rates this year, this spring and, um, you know, I don't know, do you want to give a little geographical context to interpreting that test or... Um, Have we taken it far of, enough? One of the things that I always feel, and Dan gets your take on this too, is if it's corn after soybeans, I just don't feel that the PSNT or the PPNT tests are very bad, especially the PPNT test. I don't even know that I, I bother taking my time. If it's corn after corn, then there is certainly a potential there, especially if they you know, they just did not have a very good crop on that field. And there's, there's a pretty good indication that there's carryover in there. Yeah. I think the only thing I would say with corn after soybeans would be if you've got manure, if there's a manure history in the field, then there might be some reasoning to take that. And there, there's a, the corn bulletin has kind of a decision tree with this in terms of talking about whether or not you think you have a, maybe potentially residual nitrate. So you can kind of follow that, but manure history is one of them. You know, and anything essentially that would have been applied before a pre previous crop would have had nitrogen would be, would be another situation you could look at it. Because I've looked at the, the pre-plant nitrate test in a corn following soybean situation, and really the, it kind of fell apart if you look at the situations where we didn't at least have a recent manure history in the field. It just didn't 
If you looked at the numbers, the numbers really didn't follow very closely. But I think it does work very well, just at least to me, to screen some of these sites. If you kind of fit in that category, manure history, continuous corn, and you're wondering, it's it's something that I think could at least give you an idea of potentially cutting back because that's really what I'm looking at is I really want a tool or something that would give at least some confidence to a grower that at least I could start off with a lower rate because that's really key with a lot of this when we start talking about water quality is, I mean, once it's there, we, we got to have something to take it out and that's the crop. And if it's more than the crop needs, that's one of the things, uh, one of the questions I think in was talking about um, managing and optimize production to reduce environmental impacts. Um, really the best thing we can do with our annual cropping system is trying to uh, target as close as we can to the economic optimum nitrogen rate within a particular field. And that's within a particular field. We know there's variability out there because once we get beyond that point, we know it's almost one-to-one -one what we can leave from what we've over applied. It's just trying to get closer to that target point is really the key with it. And so that's the challenge. We don't have a good way to figure that initial stage out. And I don't really care who you talk to. I just, looking at all the research we just haven't been able to figure out here i don't know who else or who anybody else that would have been able to figure it out out there and some of the crop models i think we're kind of going towards that realm but still that nitrogen cycle is a tough one to predict everything if you look at inputs and outputs in that whole system so a quick question here a quick answer uh pre sidrus nitrate test and core depth so this is the test that we're taking what typically the beginning of june what's your recommended uh Core depth for that. PSNT is just a one foot test, the one that we do in late May, early June. The PPNT is a two foot test. That's the one okay. that we would do before planting and before application. Okay, so uh, let's move on then. Um, let's see here. ESN, we had some questions come in regarding to ESN, the polymer coated urea versus uh, what they call treated urea. So I'm assuming they're talking about the urease inhibitors. Do you guys want to just make mention of those uh, technologies and any take-homes. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, if they're talking treated urea, they're probably thinking of treated with a nitrification inhibitor, possibly. So ESN, in my opinion, would be, and the data would suggest that it's probably more consistent um, use or would be more consistent than a treated urea with a nitrification inhibitor. But you got to use the ESN in a blend. Um, it's just too cost. Uh, the cost is just not, it's high enough that it, it has to be a blend. And usually one third ESN and two thirds conventional urea works fairly well. Now there, the other alternative or the other option that they might be thinking of is treating urea with a, with a urease inhibitor. Um, and that would be like something like NBPT. Now that is important for surface applications that don't get incorporated within two to three days, but there, it's not protecting it against nitrification where the urea or the ESN product is the actual product that is a true controlled release um, over a period of time. So it protects not only against volatilization, but it also protects against uh, nitrification law or denitrification leaching losses because it's a controlled or, sl or true slow release product. Yeah, and that's one of the things you've got to separate the two out in terms of what you're trying to do um, with urea right now. I don't think I mean, even these early applications, I just we don't have a good enough data with any of the nitrification inhibitors to say that essentially that they would be beneficial at this point. And I think a lot of our loss potential will come from volatility. So you could say, OK, well, then if we're going early like this, should we put something like an agritain on? Well, I mean, yeah, you could, but. You know, I, right now, as dry as it is, I mean, if it's near the surface, the, that, you know, the lifespan of agritain, I would say it's probably a couple weeks, maybe, as the cooler it is, the, you know, the the better that hold's going to be. I just, there's way too much risk here. And that data I was referencing when I, in my opening comments, um, there was some work in the West where they were looking at surface applications of urea at 80 pounds. There were three different applications. One was around December 1st. I think one was somewhere around early February, and then they had one around April 1st. And if you looked at the loss potential, it was about 30% of the material total of those three applications was lost due to volatility with the greatest loss potentials occurring at the December 1st application, second most at the February, mid-February, and then the lowest 
in April. And that really, I think, speaks to the fact that um, you need something to incorporate that material. If it's near the surface, especially right now with these windy days and these these dry days we have, if it's enough moisture there to start dissolving, which it doesn't take a lot on urea, we're going to suffer a fair amount of volatility. I mean, the numbers that they were showing, I think, in that that study out west was that February application, they were losing between 10 to 15 percent off due to volatility with that. And that's pretty significant. And when you start talking about the prices of everything there, just to get an early start on things, um, Fabian in our podcast did have an in some interesting comments, you know, related to ESN, whether or not now you could possibly apply that. I mean, I you shouldn't have the volatility issues with it. Um but the thing is, I try to at least get it incorporated. And that's kind of the thing with any of these materials. It would be a good idea to incorporate it. Now, for any of you that are applying maybe AMS, DAP, or MAP, remember that the form of nitrogen is ammonium. So it's not ammonia. Um, urea has to first convert to ammonia gas. And that's where the volatility happens with it. So with products like MAP, DAP, and AMS, I mean, that stuff's not going to volatilize, you know, whether or not it nitrifies is another question, but, you know, crediting it, you could certainly, you know, consider crediting more of that material if you're applying it earlier and not really worry about that volatility of it. So that's, again, where my concern is, again, we may not be losing some of this nitrogen to the water, but, you know, if you're losing, say, 10% or 15%, you know, really, do you want to go back and then supplement just for this, trying to get this early start, particularly when we've got so many options we can do at or post planning with urea, that it doesn't make a lot of sense right now to really jump the gun on that one. Anhydrous, I think, would make more sense at this point, and it would be a safer safer bet for early application. Where I see ESN fitting in, I think, for, for some growers on medium and fine textured, poorly drained soils, is it's kind of an alternative to doing a split application. I think that's where it fits. If you, if you just don't want to deal with split applications, but you have some poorly drained soils that you know are, are susceptible to denitrification in a wetter year, then you can use it as a blend in your pre-plant with regular urea. And you could get that kind of peace of mind that you got some of that protected probably up until the middle of June. Um, from an economic return on investment standpoint, in our study in Southeast Minnesota the last two years, I've only seen two of eight site years where the urea ESN blend yielded better than pre-plant urea, and it was never better than a split application. So I think that makes sense is that, you know, you need to think of it as an alternative to a split application, but there's really no reason if you want to do a split application of urea or UAN, it's probably going to be as effective. And if you've got the time and the equipment to do it, it's probably going to be cheaper. But ESN in a blend can be, you know, fairly inexpensive treatment. And I would definitely recommend that over treating regular urea with a nitrification inhibitor. I just, as Dan said, I have not seen enough responses to that to justify doing that. So we've had a couple of questions come in uh, related to cover crops. I guess uh, one about nutrient release from cover crops and the the, the timing for uh, crop needs, you know, how do those things sync up or not sync up? Uh, and then there was kind of a second question here uh, comparing the efficacy of, uh, I think, nitrification, nitrification inhibitors in fall applications versus having a cover crop that might be doing some scavenging of, of nitrogen. So kind of two somewhat related uh, topics there and let you, get you guys give your thoughts. <clears throat> well, on the cover crop side, there's a lot of questions on the release and that's one of the things with cereal rye. I mean, we've got enough data really, if you look at and uh, Matt Ruark was a couple of weeks ago was talking at the 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 soil fertility conference down in uh, Mankato, talking a little bit about some of their challenges there, where they're not seeing a lot of release, and that's kind of the issue with it is um, it can be a very good scavenger to try to pull some of that nitrate out of the soil that may just be potentially lost to tile lines. But we are, I mean, I've seen some instances where it takes a little bit more nitrogen in the spring, really post rise. So there's a lot of things we don't really know. On that, and I know Jeff, you've had some experience with that with some of your your studies, but some of the rate trials we've done, I mean, it just seems like we may need a little bit more, which in you know, in some regards, if it's you know spending the cost to do some of this tile, this this we are trying to do some management of of some of the tile water to pull nitrate out, it might be cheaper just to buy a little extra and use some of these cover crops. But uh, the cycling side, I mean, if it does happen, I think it takes a while for that to kick in really. So it's not really, 
immediate um, that you're getting anything out. And if it does release, it might be releasing fairly late in the growing season when we see a lot of our and mineralization from the soil organic matter too at, at points in time uh, late in the season. So that's one of the things on the fertilizer side. I haven't really seen it right now in most of our Minnesota data that we can actually apply less. And I don't know, Jeff, if you've got any comments based on some of your drainage plots. Yeah, Ryan, when I saw this question, I I kind of thought that maybe the, the person that asked it is interested in like a man fall manure applications and and should they use a nitrification inhibitor with their fall manure or should they just put a cover crop out there and thinking that, well, the cover crop will scavenge and protect that end and then release it next year. And what I would recommend in that regard is if you're putting manure out in the fall when soil temps are about 55 degrees, which is probably like you know mid, mid October or earlier, um, then I think the nitrification inhibitor with the manure is a valuable uh, opportunity because I we've got data that shows that it works. Um, if it's even earlier than that, uh, the nitrification inhibitor may help, but it's not going to maybe last the whole time. The cover crop, if you're talking about September applications, the cover crop has a pretty good chance of establishing and probably getting scavenging some of that end if you get decent moisture for its growth in the fall. Now, the question is, is it going to be available from the cover crop the next year? Well, that's going to depend a lot upon the cover crop species, the carbon and nitrogen ratio, and the termination date. And also, was the cover crop incorporated with tillage or was it left lay on the soil surface? So if it's a grass cover crop like rye, um, it's going to have a higher carbon and nitrogen ratio, and it's probably going to tie up a little bit of that end. And some of that end may not be available for the next year. But is it better than doing nothing and leaving the field fallow and letting that end denitrify and potentially be lost? Yes, it certainly is. So from the trade-off perspective is if you're putting manure out there and, you know, right after soybeans are harvested at early October, um, I would use a nitrification inhibitor in, with injected manure, especially swine manure that has a high uh, inorganic end content. Um, that's going to give you pretty good protection. And after soybeans, it's it's sometimes difficult to get a cover crop established that's going to do enough to really to really um, effectively uh, scavenge that nitrogen. And and I know Melissa and I, one of her grad students had a had a study on that here at Wasika and at another location, and that was a challenge to get that to work with the cover crop after manure applied in early October. All right, so uh, good information there. We do have a question about strip till, so practice, tillage practice, and uh, nitrogen applications. And uh, do, do you want to make any comments on timing, rates, things to think about with that uh, technology? Well, I know yeah, certainly okay. that that's one of the questions with fall applications and strip till, <clears throat> especially with urea, is whether or not it's a good idea. And with the banding application, seems to be slightly better than broadcast, particularly where timing isn't as affected, but there's certainly, you know, some questions there with it. So, I mean, I think if that is the option, if you are using urea, it does seem to be, a, I think, a little bit better option than broadcasting. And I think that kind of points to maybe some of the aspects of seeing more volatility of the of the nitrogen from ammonia loss versus um, nitrate loss um, with where we kind of seen differences within some of the studies. We did have two three-year studies here at Wasika. They're they're actually 25 years ago, believe it or not, looking at nitrogen management in strip till. The first one was at S Rock in 97 to 99. And in that study, we did not put NSERV with our fall anhydrous. And in one of the three years, the fall anhydrous treatment was far inferior to pre-plant and application, which in this case was also anhydrous. The other two years, there were no differences. In another three-year study that occurred after that, two of the three years, the fall anhydrous had lower yields than any spring of the any of the spring end treatments, and it didn't matter whether we used NSERV or we did not. In that later study, the best treatments were spring ammonia, which is really not something somebody wants to do in a strip till system. So it's kind of practically not, not a viable option. But other treatments that worked well were Coulter injected UAN. And I would, if they do that, I would not wait. As soon as you can row that corn, you can start making those applications. You don't need to wait till it's V4, or V5, V6 corn. All of our split applications, any combinations of at planting and Coulter injected UAN all worked well or urea. 
and UAN pre and or colter injection with urea and urease inhibitors, those worked well too. Um, the only caution I would have is the worst treatments, like I said, were the fall anhydrous treatments with or without NSERV in that later study. And also treatments where we put up to 40 pounds of N on it with the planter as a surface dribble band. I think that might actually just be too much. And I'd be cautioned about how much you don't need that much N on at planting. 20 pounds should be plenty and then do the rest at split application or side dress. So those are good options for strip till, in my opinion, on, on medium and fine textured soils. Coarse textured soils, it's going to have to be split applications and probably more than two. So, so here's a question. Uh, we're going to talk about southeast Minnesota now, so the karst region of the state. Uh, we got some variable soils that are highly productive uh, as far as corn production. What are the, the BMPs or what strategies would you recommend for nitrogen management in that environment? Yeah, again, I think uh, pre-plant applications of anhydrous and urea are going to be very effective most years on those soils. Um, there are some occasional coarse textured soils that are mixed in in certain areas along Interstate 90. So you have to be careful of those areas of your field. Those might need a split application. I've done a lot of work looking at split applications and combinations of blends of ESN urea as alternatives to split applications in Southeast Minnesota. Um, about 20% of the time I get a yield response to split applications. It's hard to predict, like Dan said, you know, the nitrogen cycle is just not, it's not always about spring rainfall. Sometimes I think it's these really wet falls that result in poor N carryover or almost no N in the system. And then that makes that delta yield as, as, as we talked about earlier, bigger the next year. And then uh, even split application can't make up that, that difference. But when I do see an advantage to split applications in Southeast Minnesota, it's usually not a big yield increase. It's that we get by with a little bit less N when we do a split application and that's where the advantage comes. Okay, excellent. So we're going to switch gears here. We're going to move on to the, the next nutrient on our list here, our outline. We're going to talk a little bit about potassium, finally. Uh, we should have probably booked two hours here today. But anyways, we're going to move on to potassium. We've had some dry or droughty conditions across the state, and that certainly impacts uh, uh, soil test values. And, and so there's some questions about that um, and, uh, you know, tie up or lock up of potassium in different clay soils. And so maybe just take a few minutes and Start in on some bats and issues. Well, I mean, we could spend more than probably two hours <laughs> talking about some of this stuff with the much issues I've had with this. I've said my uh, former advisor is, gave me some uh, words of wisdom on this, and it was that I'm going to end up frustrated, and I'm I'm very frustrated right now. But um, with potassium, it's one of the things we know that just during the, the growing season that we tend to see, you can see upwards of about 80 to 100 part per million difference in the soil test from spring to summer back to fall. There's just a... a uh, seasonal variation to the soil test numbers. Some of that is because, you know, you look at the middle of the summer, we've got crops that are peaking their demand. So they're just drawing as much. Same thing with nitrate. If you look at nitrate, you go in and measure in middle of June, you're going to find very little there, but that crop is just drawing whatever it can out of the soil. So there is some variability there. And I think a lot of our issues in terms of what we're seeing in these drier years is really is related to the, the amount of K that's being leached back out of the residue. So, you know, we tend to see that with drier years that if you've got moisture, even when a crop's standing in the field, if it's it's dying, um, you'll get water movement through some of that plant material that'll leach some of the potassium out. And with um, continuous corn or corn, it's more of a problem. So if you're sampling in corn residue, that's going to lock it up for a lot longer. Um, some of the data out of Iowa would show even in really wet years at best to get about 50% of the roughly, it's like 200 to 250 pounds that you can have of 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 K2O in that residue that you would get about 50% maybe back by May that you'd be not picking it all up. Soybeans usually a lot quicker because it just the way that the leaves tend to just dissolve that you should get a little bit better return. So you can get a little higher um, return, but even in some of these dry years, I kind of wonder on what we're doing. And then just the uh, shrinking and swelling of the clays. I mean, it, it impacts some of what we call the retention, um, you know, we call non-exchangeable potassium, although it is relatively exchangeable. There's soils that it doesn't seemingly you can't build the soil test up. But if you look at that non-exchangeable fraction, the, the, the crops tend to respond to what's there. 
So, I mean, I'm not recommending that anybody actually look at that because the process, it's that's the process. I'm doing that analysis now and it's driving me crazy uh, because of the variability in it. Um, but it is interesting looking at some of this and how dynamic that system is. I mean, ammonium's affected the same way. There's not exchangeable ammonium and I see the same seasonal variation. It's one of the things we're looking at now is I'm wondering if some of what we're, we talk, call organic matter, burning the organic matter really is maybe just some of that what we're seeing some of these, these non-exchangeable fractions being affected by some of their management. So it's, it's more dynamic. It's really complex. Um, what I would say is just trust your soil tests. Um, you try to take them at the same point, although with potassium, that's one of the things that I just wouldn't forget about it. And that's one of the, I think the biggest mistakes, if you look at the prioritizing of the nutrients, obviously nitrogen's always first for corn just because of the overall ROI then I think a lot of growers just default to phosphorus because their soils were natively low in it. The problem is, though, is our soil test for phosphorus is pretty good at predicting the overall need for phosphorus. So if you get above, if you're in with the Bray test, if you're 25 or above, the chances that anything you're applying is actually needed by that crop is very, 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 very low. So, you know, you really at that point, you're just replacing what's there. And I think you look at economics right now. I mean, certainly if you don't want to eliminate phosphorus, it's something you could look at maybe putting on half to you know 60 percent of what the crop is removing over a two year period, cutting costs a little bit and um, you should be fine with it. So it's one of the things with potassium right now, there's much more you know issues in terms of questions on variability. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit is this K-based saturation garbage that's floating around out there. And you know, I, I was looking at that that VRAFY software. Uh, somebody asked about that, and I was looking at that, and that's nothing more than essentially inputting your your yield map in, and it's spitting out a recommendation based on removal. Although they did an interesting thing on there talking about this revolutionary soil test thing that's that's included in it, which. I was rather interested, but there's when I, I came across it, I came across Hefty's website where they were talking about base saturation. And that's one of the things that looking at a lot of the data, I was looking at what they were presenting is I wasn't necessarily convinced that we need to have these high base sat numbers on that. And I had one grower talk about this at, um, I was at Jackpot a few weeks ago talking about that. And he was figuring he was need, need to invest about 1500 an acre in K just to get him up to where he needed to be. And that just seems ridiculous because if you look at the overall return it might take you 100 years to return all that out of there so it's it's one of the things to watch out for with that is a when i look at the numbers so if you look at soil test um we know if we're about 200 or above generally we don't have too much of an issue where i worry too much about potassium if we're below that then yes the base sat can come into play if you've got low soil tests and low base sat you tend to see issues where we see pretty high yield increases but we've had instances where we have low soil tests where we have higher base sats that we don't see a yield response so it's the the problem with k is there's a lot of questions and i said it is frustrating i'm you know i'm sure a lot of you in managing it too are frustrated with it and you see your numbers decline that um these growers aren't really happy about seeing that just based on these fer fertility programs but you know, a lot of it's just what's happening right now. And I would suspect that we, if we get in some wetter years, we'll see some recovery where the numbers will go back up again. Um, but it's it's just the nature of the beast right now. There's just a lot of things, you know, out there that, that can impact that soil test. And it shouldn't if you look at it, but it does. I mean, it's just phosphorus, while it's more chemically more, if you look at it, it's more of a mess. If you look at what it can bind with and what it can react with in the soil, I mean, it's the soil test is way more straightforward. In terms of giving me me an idea of, of where a response is going to occur. Okay, um, I guess we're going to jump ahead on our outline a little bit and, and jump into the banding category because it uh, can relate to potassium here as well as phosphorus. Uh, and there were some questions about banding and strip till of P and K. Uh, and then, you know, uh, broadcast versus banding and some of those issues with regards to, to rates and return on investment. So. Yeah, so I think the first question I saw there uh, was how much can P and K be reduced when band deep banded with strip till? And I think for potassium, I wouldn't recommend reducing rates. But if you do, no more than a third. Our current guidelines say you can go up to a half. Um, the recent data we collected uh, 
suggests that maybe that's not the case. For phosphorus, some of our data shows that that both band and broadcast rates can often be less, can be reduced a little bit, maybe by as much as a third or more, and still produce similar yields on acid and neutral pH soils. And the reason for that is that is that our guidelines or our recommended rates and especially crop removal rates usually increase soil test phosphorus. So to maintain soil test phosphorus at a at a medium to high level, you probably don't need crop removal to maintain it there and you probably don't need that much to optimize production. So yeah, you might be able to reduce it a little bit, but it's probably not related as much to banding as it is just the fact that that in most of our medium and fine textured soils, crop removal is going to build soil test level and it's going to build it to very high and even higher levels. Um, it, there's a bit of an unknown at high pH soils and maybe Dan will touch on that. Um, the other thing to think about that's always a concern when deep banding, especially in strip till, is this depth of fertilizer placement. It's a problem. It's often most of these knife injected strip till machines place the fertilizer deeper than six inches and that's kind of our standard soil sampling depth so then you may not be getting that in your soil sample or any of that band and that applied fertilizer or very little of it and you might see soil test values start to decline rapidly just because you're placing it deeper than you're actually soil sampling so the follow-up question was how crucial is banding what do studies say on return on investment my data shows that buying equipment for the sole purpose of band applying P and K, P and K is probably not going to pay. However, I still recommend banding P and K in strip till and in no-till maybe in alternate years because the data shows that occasionally it is a little bit better. It might have a higher, slightly higher yield or maybe a little bit better return on investment, but it's not very consistent. So at very high fertilizer prices, the return on investment might be a little better. Um, the economics might be a little better, but there's just not enough consistency to justify going out and buying a banding rig. If you're already doing it, I wouldn't stop, but I just don't think that uh, going out there for the purchase of it just for that purpose is a good idea. Yeah, and Jeff, Jeff, you mentioned... So Jeff mentioned high pH soils, and that's what I just want to hit on quick, Ryan. Um, so with that, um, you know, we do have some some data. If you get above a pH of seven and a half, that you're probably looking at better options about if you're broadcasting to do it every year. And certainly that's one of the things that we have seen. The only issue I've seen with some of those soils is even fall versus spring that for corn, it seemed to be better to have the phosphorus on in the spring um, because the time at which the phosphorus can react with calcium in the soil, it, it starts to, I wouldn't say tie it up, but it binds it essentially where it seems like you have, it, it's not showing up as much in the soil test and potentially in the plant. So that's one of the things on high pH soils. I mean, I would probably consider at least going every year. The banding questions in an interesting one, because I mean, theoretically, if you have a band, you're super saturating a zone with phosphorus that you should have less issues for tie up that you know, potentially it could be better, but on paper, but we just don't know with that. So that's, I guess the only thing I'd say. And then the other thing, Jeff, that I echo those sentiments, all the data I have essentially shows that if you're hitting exact removal. So if you look at software where you can input your yield map and export out a actual, just a, a recommendation that you don't need to be down to the pound for especially for maintenance for phosphorus because if you look at the removal that removal value is only an estimate if you look at my data there's a pretty wide range in actual values across fields so there's really no clear idea of essentially if that removal value is accurate uh, the only thing i will say there was one question somebody had that i remember looking in here talking about high yield and looking at that in terms of P and K management and in, you know, some of those situations, if you're looking at trying to, I mean, I, I guess I can't argue against anybody trying to manage the soils up or just slightly above the, what we call the critical levels in those circumstances, if you're trying to just maximize yield potential in, in those cases. But, um, you know, we certainly know with P and K, there are some options. Um, it's just, um, I think high pH again, every year I would do it. If you don't have high pH, you could go every other year and save yourself a year on the application costs. So that's really the, I think the main thing is just to look at how that fertilizer will react with in the soil, the in the soil chemistry itself. 
So we had a couple of questions related to no-till and vertical till and nutrient stratification and and what how are some strategies or things to think about when we're dealing with with those systems? Yeah, I think that true no-till is the biggest challenge because you've got both, you know, what's your options for buying P and K at broadcast uh, primarily and without incorporation. And from a phosphorus standpoint, that's not a good situation because you've got environmental concerns from a from a crop uptake standpoint it's probably not a big deal the most plants can utilize phosphorus and concentrated it near the soil surface most of the fine roots that take up in you know, the phosphorus uptake it can be in that surface soil but from a uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus to surface waters those broadcast applications are an environmental concern and for, for potassium it reduces if you do all your broadcast applications in no-till you're going to get case stratification and you're going to see that show up in like this last year when you get a dry year where where the the K that is just not where the water is. Um, so even though the K is taken up by diffusion, the plant just doesn't utilize it very well when it's stratified all in the top six inches or possibly in the top few inches. Because like Dan said, the 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 corn and soybean plants are huge pumps of potassium. They take up a lot. It's in the it's in the residue, it's in the stover. And it leaches back out, but it leaches back out and it just lays on the surface of the soil. So in no-till, that's like a worst case scenario. You're broadcasting your K on the surface. The plants are taking it out of the soil and leaving it on the surface. And eventually it's going to be a problem. So if you can figure out a way to deep band in true no-till, maybe it's only one out of four years or one out of six years. That would be very helpful to get some at P or K placed a little deeper and not put it all on the surface. And liquid options really aren't all that great. And you could do that with the planter. But the thing is, you got to think about if you're paying two to three times you would per unit nutrient for versus broadcast, is that a better option? And with K, I mean, that's really where it gets expensive with that. So, I mean, there are some options out there and I get questions on that two by two. I mean, that is a way you could look at putting it deeper, but then you're you're spending more per unit nutrient. And really that's on yield, I mean, placement, we talk all about this stuff. I mean, really, when it comes down to yield, essentially, it's at the end of the season. Is there enough nutrients there to supply the crop and not short them at key points in time? It's really, it, it's simply, that's what it boils down to. So, you know, we think about all these things. We think about all these little products you put in for availability. And it's just, I mean, it's 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 simple. I mean, it's was there enough nutrient to get the crop to max yield on all this stuff? And that's it's really the key question. So it's just the question of how much money you, you spend to get there. So we're in our last 60 seconds and we haven't even gotten to sulfur. Uh, we want to just give us a quick uh, 90 second synopsis of sulfur. And one one question in particular, I've heard this come up a number of times this winter uh, of, of sulfur on soybeans. And so that's that's what I know is on some people's minds. And so maybe just give us a quick, uh, quick and dirty on the sulfur and then we're going to have to kind of close things out. So I'll give you a quick and dirty. So I also asked about boron. I will say no, don't put it on beans. Don't put it on dry beans. Toxicity is an issue. Uh, sulfur on soybeans it depends on whether or not you're applying it to the crops ahead of it. Um, generally, the rates most growers are applying it, there's enough that'll carry over to beans. Even at 10 pounds, you see situations where the soybeans shouldn't really need it. And that's kind of the struggle on it is, is since I've got fields that more growers are applying it on other crops that I don't see a response to beans. So it's not my first... Thing I would be concerned about with with soybeans. Um, if you're gonna put it on, go no more than ten pounds before, ahead of it, and um, that's kind of what I would recommend. But I just wouldn't expect a high or a, you know a pretty consistent ROI with that. Especially, I just it makes more sense to take care of the previous crop. Okay, well, uh, thanks, guys, and uh, you know we didn't clearly we didn't get to every question today, and we'll figure out how we're going to address that. But I do do want to thank our our speakers or discussion leaders today, Dan and Jeff, uh, for being on. Uh, it was a very uh, good session, I felt. Uh, and I also want to thank, uh, again, the Minnesota Soybean and Corn Research and Promotion Councils, uh, again, for their support today.